Good morning. Everyone made it here safe and sound this morning. That's good to say. No. Uh, I'm Ryan Siegel. I'm here with the Smart Energy Design Assistance Center, or CDAC, here at the University of Illinois. So, I do want to thank everyone for coming this morning. Uh, this morning, we're going to cover uh, residential, uh, the residential side of the energy code uh, from uh, for about the next hour and a half. Then we'll have a 30-minute uh, break. Uh, I know several of you are here just for the first session, uh, but if you decide you would do want to stay for the uh, second session, which is on energy, uh, the energy code commercial lighting portion, uh, you are welcome to do so. Uh, so it'll be about a 30-minute break between the two sessions, uh, and then we'll do the uh, commercial lighting portions uh, from 11 to 12.30. So, uh, a couple of housekeeping uh, items before we get started. Uh, first, uh, I do ask please silence your cell phones. Uh, if you do have to take a call, uh, realize that we do have uh, businesses we got to keep. Uh, so, you can do so, just please take it outside. So, bathrooms are at either end of the hallway uh, here, and uh, we do want to thank the uh, Central Illinois IES chapter uh, for hosting uh, us this morning uh, here at the iHotel. So, I'll give you a little bit of background about CDAC and who we are. Uh, we are here housed here at the University of Illinois. Uh, we are an applied research. Uh, division here, uh, and obviously our mission is to help decrease the <coughs> energy footprint in, in the state of Illinois. Uh, that's both public sector and private sector, so that fits very well with the uh, Illinois Energy Code. The Illinois Energy Code uh, technical assistance and training is uh, provided through the Illinois EPA State Energy Office. Uh, so we do want to thank them for their support of us. And we do have several uh, functions and features uh, to provide technical assistance uh, to you and your clients. We have an 800 number as well as an email address, energycode at cdac.org. And so uh, this can be used for any energy code technical assistance uh, you may require, whether that's building owners, architects, engineers, uh, designers, code officials, you know, we are here to support uh, any projects across the state of Illinois. So, we also do have several online resources at our website, which not only includes uh, archived versions of our workshops and webinars, uh, which today's workshop, uh, a video as well as the uh, PDF of the presentation will be posted to uh, our website. You can also get the archived copies of our uh, other webinars uh, as well as workshops here at the site. For those who may not be able to travel uh, for training uh, or if you have some, some building owners that want to get a little more uh, information about the Energy Code, we do have uh, training modules on our website. Uh, there's presently four of them up there one on residential, uh, and then the other three are commercial uh, lighting, HVAC, and building envelope. So we have presently there on the 2015 uh, IECC and Illinois Energy Code, uh, a new set will be going up for the 2018 uh, here before long. So here's a brief look at our website. Uh, Notice the energy code training is up in the upper right hand corner uh, along with the menu along the left hand side to get to our workshops and our webinars. So, as far as looking at uh, codes and code adoption across the state of Illinois, uh, most codes are adopted on a local jurisdictional level and so we see there's quite a, a spread of building codes across the state of Illinois. The most common uh, presently being the 2012 followed by the 2006 uh, versions. So it's, it's 
almost uh, almost a bell curve with the exception of 2009, uh, where we have a little bit of a dip. Uh, it was actually, uh, I believe, just last week that the city of Chicago actually adopted a new building code as well. Uh, so they have left the dedicated Chicago building code and have moved to the I codes as well. Uh, so that's that's been quite a uh, quite a ride there. There are a few codes that the state of Illinois adopts on a statewide basis, which there's good and bad to uh, adopting, you know, on a, a more regional uh, basis. Uh, one downfall is because Illinois adopts this and continues to uh, in push towards the front, you know, that, that does increase the stringency uh, of codes. You know, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit here. On the residential side, the code has become uh, a more focused on usability and flexibility over these past few code cycles. Uh, and so uh, one benefit of adopting codes on a more regional basis is people are only, only having to remember one set of rules uh, rather than, you know, oh, I'm in the city of Urbana, okay, I need one, I need to pull up this set of rule books. And then if I'm over in Champaign, it's a different set. And if I'm in Savoy, I'm in a different set. If I'm outside the city limits, now I'm on a fourth set. Uh, so having to continually ask, okay, where am I at and which set of rules do I have to follow? That's a <coughs> of complexity. So, uh, but Illinois, they do the energy code, plumbing code, and the accessibility code. Uh, now, I will note that there are a couple of workshops uh, planned to come forward, uh, planned coming up here, that will combine uh, both the Illinois Energy Code as well as the Illinois Accessibility Code, uh, because a new one just came out this year. One thing that the uh, International Code Council does make available uh, that's very helpful is they make all their codes available uh, for viewing online at no cost. Uh, now these documents are searchable, but they're not uh, selectable or printable. Uh, but it's not uncommon where I will even have my code books and also have the online version open because it can help me get to the right spot uh, within the code book fairly quickly. Uh, rather than trying to have to dig through uh, or if you're working with someone, you can say, here's the link, go to this section, uh, and they can uh, see it as well. Uh, this is the, the link provided to uh, the uh, International Energy Code, the 2018 version. As far as the codes and code, uh, their effectiveness, this chart shows the uh, change in energy consumption for a building over time based on which code version they are using. Uh, so as you can see, the residential and commercial, there were some very big steps here right around the 2012 uh, time frame. So uh, prior to that, we were running, uh, if our baseline building back in, built in 1975 uses 100 units of energy, prior to these major steps, uh, buildings would use somewhere around 80%, 80 to 85% of the same uh, energy per square foot. Uh, then in around 2010 to 2013, that dropped down to about 50%. Uh, so that was some major steps that we took. And if we look at where Illinois uh, was in their code adoption, uh, the uh, Purple arrows are when the city of Chicago adopted an energy code back in 2002. Uh, so they were kind of the, the leaders in this. Illinois adopted it back in 2004, <clears throat> but it didn't become a, that was for state facilities. For private sector, it didn't become effective for a couple of years. Uh, so that let the state kind of say, okay, I'll be the guinea pig on this first to figure out if this works. And then they came back in here. Commercial started with 2007 and residential in 2010. 
Now, in residential, we can appreciate that there was a lot of heartland lost here. Because as you can see, that 2010 was right after a major, major revision to the energy code. And then two years later, another major revision occurred. So here you have people where you have no energy code, all of a sudden now you're designing to a, you know, a more stringent energy code, and then it gets even worse. Uh, now as you can see, since that time, it really hasn't changed much. Uh, the code has really focused more on, you know, how do we make it more usable, and, and did we necessarily say what we wanted to the first time we put code language in? <clears throat> it's not uncommon in codes where you will go in, you'll put code language in, and then come back and someone goes to use it, and you're like, well, that wasn't quite what I meant. Uh, so sometimes it takes a couple of cycles to really refine that language and, and get it in a more usable state. So the International Energy Code, uh, International Energy Conservation Code, is one of several uh, codes put up by the International Code Council. Uh, these are collectively referred to as the I codes. And so these can include not only uh, what we have here, the Inter International Building Code, the International Residential Code, uh, covers fuel gas code, uh, and a number of different things. Now these are just models of codes, so they provide some, you know, some code language that it is not enforceable by itself until a locality, municipality, or uh, jurisdiction, or a state adopts it as this is the enforceable code. Uh, it's not uncommon where that will come with some amendments. So the state of Illinois does have a few, uh, few amendments to the code. Uh, the, what we will present here today, we will include those amendments because here we are in the state of Illinois. So uh, some of those amendments, and that amendment cycle occurs every three years. Uh, so <clears throat> something that, that the uh, International Code Council did uh, a couple of cycles ago was they included the International Energy Conservation Code in, <clears throat> in the International Residential Code by reference. Rather than restating the entire code, they just said for the internet, for energy efficiency, go see the IECC and that will cover it. So. Uh, the IRC is a much more broad code. Uh, this is more what we think of when we think of a safety, you know, safety type code, dealing with structural, plumbing, and mechanical, uh, and the other systems in a home. Uh, so, as far as are we in residential or are we in commercial? Sometimes this gets a little hairy and depends on which code book you are looking at. Uh, here for uh, residential, they're noting one and two family homes, as well as uh, other residential buildings, three stories or less uh, above the grade. Now, we'll note here in a little bit, when we uh, get into the specific definition, uh, along with all the associated code language, Illinois has a slight amendment on this, which includes the city of Chicago has a, gets an extra story. There are four stories in less. So, uh, here it also talks about occupancies, and the occupancy definitions are actually found over in the International Building Code, or IBC. So, which again, the link is provided there for it. Commercial is anything that is not residential, by definition. So, they make that one a little easy. As far as code language, uh, the energy code talks about two types of things. One is prescriptive language, and the other is mandatory language. Prescriptive is your, your, shop, your grocery shopping list. So, you go through the code and each one, you check it off and, okay, 
did I comply with this piece? Yes or no? Okay, did I comply with this piece? Yes or no? So there's no uh, real trade-offs occurring uh, within the prescriptive. Mandatory is you have to do it no matter what path you are choosing, uh, which we'll talk a little bit uh, in a moment here about the different paths. So, uh, as far as the paths, there are three paths for residential compliance. Uh, one is prescriptive, the other is simulated uh, energy performance, so this is where you are doing a building energy model. Uh, this is not very common uh, in residential, but we have seen it on occasion. And so you're looking at how does the building that I have designed compare with a reference building that exactly meets the code in the prescriptive form. So uh, does the building that I want to build in the way I want to build it use less energy than a model, than a, than a standard code compliant building? The third way is uh, the energy rating index, uh, formerly known as a, the HERS rating. So this is one that, that we have seen very little of as far as people going through a HERS rating. Part of that is just trying to find a HERS rater in this region. There's not too many of them. Uh, so those are the three compliance paths, prescriptive, energy performance, and energy rating. Within the prescriptive, there's a little bit of a, a caveat. I noted that there's not really trade-offs allowed in prescriptive, with one exception. And that is, in the building envelope, they do have a trade-off option available. And this is where a res check comes in. This is actually the form, or the, the function that res check is doing, is it is providing that calculation of that trade-off of U values to see is this a code compliant envelope? That's what ResCheck is checking, it's just the envelope. So. Note there are several mandatory requirements. These are mandatory no matter what path you're taking. So even if you're uh, doing building energy performance, you still have to make sure you install all the HVAC controls that are labeled as mandatory uh, in the code. So. These are several of the categories that they have mandatory requirements. Uh, a lot of this is, uh, as you probably noticed, uh, HVAC related. Because HVAC, sizing it and installing it correctly is very critical for it to actually function correctly, for it to function well. So, we'll try not to kill you too much with definitions. Uh, but this is what Illinois states a residential building for the purposes of the Illinois Energy Code is. Uh, call out, you know, one or two family dwelling or any building three stories or less with multiple dwelling units primarily on a permanent basis. So things like a motel does not count because uh, they're not there on a primary basis. Uh, they knew, do enumerate several, uh, several types, but also here you'll notice municipalities with a population of one million or more, of which there is one in the, uh, in the state of Illinois, you get an extra story within the uh, city limits of the city of Chicago. So. This was a big change. Definition of approved changed uh, from 2015 to 2018. As you can see here, prior to 2018, you had to have nationally recognized organizations doing testing uh, in order to show, uh, in order to get approval. Now, it's just, is it acceptable to the code official? So your local code official has a little more latitude as far as, does this make sense? This is particularly uh, beneficial in the residential section because, let's face it, most residential buildings are not new buildings. 
So most things that we're dealing with is renovations. And so trying to look at this and say, are we, are, are we doing what we can with what we have, given the constraints of we have an existing building that was built long before a code ever was around. So just having it acceptable to the code official can have a much more uh, flexibility uh, for that. So. Air barrier, a little bit of a, a rewording here. Uh, the biggest thing was they're now calling out that your air barrier needs to be in a continuous manner. So you should, you need to be able to place your pencil on the air barrier of your drawing and you need to be able to trace the entire outline without picking your pencil up. And so anywhere that you have joints between two surfaces, that's probably where you're going to run into some challenges as far as how are you going to make sure that you get that continuous. We can, we can all work real well when we have large flat surfaces. It's the corners where we're going to have our issues. So, speaking of air barriers, uh, this would be interesting to know. As far as how many of you are, are uh, still using or still seeing out there mostly uh, sheet products, you know, large roll sheet products. So several of you, okay, uh, seeing it more uh, sheathing with sealed joints and penetrations where your sheathing is actually the air barrier? Couple? Are many of you seeing fluid applied systems yet? Is that? Okay, not, not as common yet. So, when we get into air leakage, uh, testing has been mandatory for some time. Uh, now, <clears throat> with this, uh, you'll notice here indicating four. Uh, in the 2015 version, Illinois required a maximum of five air changes per hour. Uh, with the 2018 version, we're now going from five down to a maximum of four uh, air changes per hour. So, so how many of you have, have gone through and, and done uh, lower door tests on, on buildings or, or been present for them yet. Several, that's good. Uh, they're generally not that hard to do. Uh, you know, it doesn't take a whole lot of time. Uh, you do have to do some prep. Is that an amendment to the code? This is in the code. This is in the code. Uh, yep, and this actually came into the code, I believe in 2012 was when Lower door testing was required. So this relaxed? Does the code used to read three and six? <clears throat> the okay. international code, they when they they uh, they changed from seven ACH to three. Okay. Illinois, when they did that, they amended it up to five and said seven to three is too much. We're gonna go to five. So Illinois did relax this relative to the uh, model code. And now we're going from five, we're moving down to four. Through an amendment. Through an amendment. That's a little bit of a question. Yes. Right, so that's, that's the amendment. Correct. Thank you. Yep. Uh, and the, the plan is uh, on this that in the next code cycle, so for the 2021 code, Illinois will remove their amendment. So it will match the three. It's, it's kind of what we uh, what we envision. So we're, we've gone from five down to four down to three, and saying, okay, we can get there, you know. But just jumping from seven to three was a bit a bit crazy, uh, especially where that was that occurred at about the same time as Illinois adopted the code. So it went from no restriction to three. So. So here's a good document as far as air leakage control. I won't cover too much about this. 
Uh, but Canada, because of their cold environment, uh, they've been focused on air leakage for a while and realized that if you build a building tighter, uh, that will likely lead to not only one that saves energy, but likely will have fewer mold issues if you build it tight and then ventilate right. Uh, so this is a, a good document that they have uh, talking about uh, various air leakage controls. So as far as new to the 2018, uh, we've got air impermeable insulation as a definition. Uh, this is predominantly going to be your foam board and closed cell uh, foam insulation. Uh, is what air impermeable insulation is like it's going to be. Uh, opaque door. Now, at what point does it change from opaque door to fenestration? Uh, or to a glazing uh, glass door, 50%. Did a little bit of, of tweaking, again, mentioning that they've done some tweaking on language here uh, to give a little more specificity. So here on, on recirculating water system, so noting here, you know, that we do have uh, recirculation uh, to get heated water back to its source. Uh, on the 2018, they've added through a cold water line. So you can either run a dedicated hot water return line or you can push it back through the cold water return line. But they do have some requirements as far as if you're going to do that, uh, one of which is you can't introduce water hotter than 104 into the cold water system. We don't want to continuously recirculate through the, hot, through the cold water line and make your cold water line a hot water line. So, uh, demand recirculation system. Uh, this is one that they kind of broke this out. Uh, they shrunk this up quite a bit. It used to say that you had to do the demand recirculation through the cold water line. The 2018 language, they took that out. So you can do demand recirculation through a dedicated hot water return line. So again, I'm trying to get that flexibility and say, well, it doesn't have to be a cold water line that, that you put it back through. So. Here's a picture showing a dedicated return line. Uh, now in commercial systems, these are typically seen as continuously recirculation in residential, uh, seeing this more as a demand, uh, a call for a demand in order to recirculate that line. Not trying to continuously have hot water there at the tap. We're trying to get the hot water there when someone needs it. I'm not sure if there's a, a state or federal regulation. A hot water heater must be located as far away from the sink as you can possibly get it. <laughs> that seems to be so common. Um, but that's where installing some of these where, you know, you'll have a little pump under the sink to get the, the water there rather than trying to, you know, run all those gallons uh, of potable water that we've treated and throwing them away. It's a nice system to have. Uh, a little more, uh, little more as far as amendments. Illinois added, you know, some local exhaust. Now, this is obviously for things specific rooms: your kitchen exhaust, your bathroom exhaust, uh, and then that as compared to a whole house mechanical ventilation system. Uh, whole house mechanical ventilation is required because we have now gotten our buildings under the 5 ACH. Uh, you have to do mechanical ventilation. Uh, Illinois also added this language down here about intake and, and exhaust for those. You have to have, uh, have, to have automatic or gravity dampers. Because uh, when the system is, is not trying to ventilate, we want to make sure that it's not ventilating. We're, we're trying to minimize leaks. Uh, 
whole house mechanical ventilation. Uh, this is a, a one way to do it is having a heat exchanger. You know, want to take the stale air from the building, bring that heat and moisture out of it, put it in the heat in the air that's coming in from outside. Because I don't want to take my 70 degree air and just throw it outside without getting any of that energy back uh, if I can avoid it because I'd really like to not bring in zero degree outside air. But with this, you know, bringing, sucking the air out of bathrooms, kitchens, which tend to be our dirtier air, uh, another place that you might extract uh, air from, if you do sealed crawl spaces. You know, pull the, extract the air out of the crawl space. Now the crawl space is negatively pressured to the house. Air is gonna to wanna to move from the house through the crawl space before leaving outside. Uh, so if you do have a, a crawl space uh, odor issue, it's not going to want to go up into the house. It's going to want to get rejected outside. So, uh, with this, I, I'd like to bring up my coworker Robert Nenna uh, to talk a little bit more about the, the chapter three and our general requirements. Thanks, Robert. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as Ryan said, my name is Robert Nella. Um, I can feel for everybody here trying to keep up with codes. I used to be an architect many years ago, and I would find myself over in the Champaign Building Department knocking on Larry Happ's door and begging information from him. And he'd look at me like, well, you're the architect. I'm like, well, but you're the building official. And, <laughs> And, uh, you know, the building codes are a moving target, so uh, try, that's why we're all here, trying to stay on top of things. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, you are familiar with uh, this map. It is a climate map of Illinois. It's under the general requirements. Um, we're in, uh, we've got two zones here in Illinois. And... Uh, <clears throat> We've got the southern and the uh, northern. Uh, the five A is a cool, humid climate. Uh, it's the northern two thirds of the state, and the warmer, uh, the, the uh, mixed humid is the, uh, the the southern part of the state. And you can see right here. This is right out of the um, um, IEC. Well, it's actually from the Insulation Institute, but. Uh, it's how the IECC subdivides the state. You can see the northern half is the, uh, the, the cooler and the southern half is the warmer. Uh, and they, climatically, they are very different. Um, <clears throat> I've been up in the Chicago area and it's been in the dead of winter. You go down to southern Illinois and it's springtime. So we have different uh, climate conditions in these, these, these two parts of the state. So you're dealing with uh, slightly different portions of the code. So being aware of that uh, uh, impacts what you need to pay attention to in the code. Um, one of the changes in the general requirements, um, it was new in the 2015 IECC, is the, uh, an exception under fenestration product ratings. It's for the U factors on uh, uh, windows, garage door windows. Uh, so a really minor thing, and my guess is most of the uh, manufacturers are aware of these types of, of uh, uh, requirements, so it really probably doesn't impact your, your practice too much. Uh, insulated siding is also called out uh, in, in the two, 215, uh, 2015 ICC. Um, once again, it's just an ASTM standard that it has to uh, comply with. So moving right here, so chapter three is pretty marginal in, in, the, in the IECC. Uh, there's not much in it, really. Um, chapter four is what we're going to spend most of our time on, uh, residential energy efficiency. And as you can see here, it is broken up into six different uh, sections. Uh, at general building thermal envelope, which is the one that we're going to be spending the most time on. Uh, systems, uh, mechanical systems, things of that nature. Uh, lighting, and then uh, the two other compliance paths that uh, Ryan mentioned before. <clears throat> so the uh, under general, the 401 uh, IECC, the uh, 
There's certain, as Ryan mentioned, there's certain parts that are mandatory, and that's just called out in the 2012 and then 2015. This is really just, uh, this is where, as Ryan was mentioning, a lot of times the codes, we're looking at the codes going, well, you know, that could be worded a lot better. There's times I find myself reading a code section three or four times, you know, trying to make heads and tails out of something. It's confusing, you know. I, if it's confusing to me, I'm sure it's confusing to other people, too. Um, and this is an attempt, you know, to take some of the language and just kind of clean it up and make it easier to read. Same thing here. Um, this was new in the 2015 ICC. It's an exemption uh, for low energy buildings. And we do get occasional questions uh, at, on our energy codes website. Does this comply as a low energy building? Because if it does, then I don't have to comply with the, the thermal requirements for the envelope. Um, and as you can see, it states that uh, right, um, right here, if it's less than 3.5 BTUs per, uh, per hour per square foot or one watt per square foot of floor area, then it's considered a low energy building. Um, and as Ryan pointed out to me, which I found quite interesting, this one watt per square foot or, or, or this 3.5 BTUs per hour per square foot, that is basically a passive house um, building. Um, so it's, it's a very low energy use building. And then uh, in 2018, this bottom line was added, the log homes. And I don't think there's too many log homes being built in, in the state of Illinois, but occasionally uh, they are built. Um, I've spent a lot of time in Colorado, which it's a different condition out there. There's a lot of log homes out there, but uh, here in the state of Illinois, we, I just uh, haven't seen too many log homes. And this is a link to the reference in the IECC <clears throat> to uh, log home construction. So there have been some changes to the uh, building thermal envelope tables. And this is something that affects uh, all of you, the designers and, uh, and the builders. Um, you can see here that in the 2012 and 15 IECC, these are U factors. So in zone four, we went from 0 0.35 in 2012, 2015 to 0 0.32 in uh, 2018. So we're making the windows, we're requiring some more energy efficient windows these days. And same in, in the uh, uh, zone five, we've gone from 0.32 down to 0.30. <clears throat> so you can see your window doesn't have to be quite as good in zone th four as it does in zone five. As you know, the lower the U value, <clears throat> the, 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 the less heat transfer there is, the better the window. But uh, that's probably just a result, oops, I'm sorry. That's a result of, uh, you know, this is a colder climate. So uh, a lower U value is required in this, in this zone five. So that, that addresses these two factors right here in this table. So the glaze fenestration, the, the um, solar heat gain coefficient, <clears throat> the table had 0.4. Well, Illinois amended that out. Uh, in 2015 to no requirement. That's what the NR is here. This, this basically tells you how much heat is being transferred through the glass. <clears throat> so Illinois took that out. Um, so that's no requirement. Um, and then here the other change is the basement wall. Our values were um, changed in Illinois specific amendments from 15 not 15 <clears throat> to uh, 15 slash 19 to 10 slash 13. And the second number is the, uh, the uh, if you insulate that wall on the inside, that is what the R value of that uh, assembly has to be, uh, 13, due to the Illinois specific amendments. So those are the changes to that table. And stop me if you, if you have any questions. Uh, and you're all familiar with this. These are the window labels by the National uh, Fen Fenestration Rating Council. 
Uh, it has your U factors and your solar heat gain coefficients on there. It's on every window. And this is the solar heat gain coefficient. This is really, uh, this is a big deal in uh, more southern climates. We're trying to limit the amount of heat that is coming through glazing because that heat then has to be extracted with mechanical cooling and that costs money, it takes energy to do that. <clears throat> so uh, this is particularly uh, important in southern climates. Yes, sir? Just a question, so is the solar heat gain coefficient back in Illinois into 2018? Not yet, no. But will it be proposed to be? Right now it's out in 2015. The 2018 there, they're proposing to reinstate the 0.4, but most most windows. Thank you. Great. Yeah. I'm just asking those. So, so, yeah. like it's coming back. so it was taken out and it looks like it may be coming back. They, they, they proposed to put it back. Okay. That's correct, right? That's what I was trying to mm -hmm. coming back. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. So that's that. Um, that's that. And let's see here. Okay, this is uh, slab R values. That has changed uh, also. Um, you can see those have changed from um, 10, uh, R10 for two feet down to it has changed to, uh, you've, it's gone to R15. So you not only have to insulate the edge of the slab and isolate it from, from uh, the wall, from the foundation wall, or that's one strategy. And you have to now put R15 under the first three, two feet, I think it is. And then there has to be R5 underneath the entire slab, um, which was, that was new in 2018, where the entire slab now has to be isolated uh, from, <clears throat> from the ground which is a very good idea. Um, I have a, the, my place is out in Colorado. Uh, one has got a slab that's on grade, um, and it's a constant heat sink. It's, it's a lower level of a house, and it's always colder down in that place. I have another little cabin where we actually tore the concrete floor out, put in a hydronic slab, <clears throat> and put insulation underneath it, and that place is always so much warmer than the other house. So that slab, uh, that insulation under that slab is a, it's a really important component as far as uh, saving energy in a hydronic slab. And this is, uh, I like to include uh, sources of information that I think are, are good for those people that want to learn a little bit more. This is from the Foundation Handbook at o Oak Ridge National Laboratories. And it's a very good handbook on, uh, on uh, foundation design. It's, as you can see, it, they address uh, crawl spaces, slab on grades, thickened slabs, uh, a little bit of everything, really. Um, and here's just an example of a hydronic slab. You can see the PEX tubing right there, uh, probably wire tied to the, uh, the welded wire fabric. Uh, for, so for the first... Uh, 36 in heated slabs for the 36 inches below right here it needs to be R15 we also need to isolate the edge of that slab I'm not, I'm not particularly fond of that detail right there I see a lot of cracking happening here in the future but nevertheless uh, and then there's the R5 under the rest of the slab right there how many of you have done hydronic slabs here in the state of Illinois so there's, there's a, there are a few, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a great way to heat a space. Uh, it's expensive because you still need an air system to uh, bring in fresh air and things of that nature, but uh, it's an incredibly energy efficient way to heat a structure. And I, I, I predict you're gonna see more of that in the future, but it is it is it can be kind of expensive. <clears throat> I, I, the little building that I did that has a hydronic slab, I could have probably done a warm air system for about $3,500, and I probably spent close to $10,000 putting in the hydronic slab, so much more expensive, but uh, really, really comfortable. So this, this is right out of that foundation handbook uh, uh, by Oak Ridge National Laboratories. They've got a lot of very good diagrams in it. 
uh, illustrating, drawing to the interior, drawing to the exterior. We always have to pay attention to how our wall assembly is going to be dry, uh, dry out if water is introduced or migrates into a wall assembly. Uh, this is just an alternative way of putting in your thermal envelope or your envelope is right at the floor system rather than in the crawl space, the crawl space being a part of the thermal envelope. Um, I'm not particularly fond of this method. I used to do a lot of consulting with HUD and we went around to Indian reservations and looked at uh, it's basically building forensics. <clears throat> and I've been down in literally hundreds of crawl spaces. And if, I tell people, if you want to find a problem with a house, and if it's got a crawl space, the first place to go is a crawl space, because that's where you're going to find the problems. And then you go up into the attic, and then you can go to the bathroom and kitchen where you'll find other problems probably. But the crawl spaces are notorious for having problems. And what, uh, what you found in a lot of those, when this was, here they're actually showing a rigid insulation to hold all that insulation fiberglass in place. But, you know, never have I seen this rigid insulation here. What I've seen is insulation placed between the joists that usually is on the floor of the crawl space. Um, only very few times have I seen this done very well where that insulation has stayed up between the floor joists where it's supposed to be. So it's, I'm not particularly fond of those details. I'd much rather see the crawl space be a part of the thermal envelope. And like Ryan mentioned, if you have a whole house ventilation system, negatively pressurizing that so that none of the pollutants that may be down in that crawl space can migrate up into the occupied space. And just another detail out of that foundation handbook. Um, there was a chapter in that uh, Oak Ridge National Labs um, publication that addressed radon. And this is not in the codes yet. Uh, I, 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 I'll bet money that this is eventually going to find its way into the codes. Um, the uh, Illinois Radon Awareness Act and the Real Property Disclosure Act, if you know you have a radon problem, you have to disclose that. Um, I, my wife and I own some rental properties, and one of these has got a crawl space in it. And I had some friends here at the U of I that were doing some uh, radon research. And they had some very sophisticated equipment to uh, measure radon, not the little hockey pucks that you can buy at Home Depot or something like that. And they, uh, I asked them, can you, they, they weren't using the equipment, I asked them, can you set that up in my crawl space over in Urbana? And they said, sure. And uh, it was a house we had just purchased. It's an older house built in the 60s. And the readings came back really high. And it was just, um, you can see um, when there are rain events, the rain saturates the ground and pushes that radon out. And you can see that on the Excel graphs. You can correlate when the radon in that crawl space peaked was when, when it rained. And it pushed all that radon up into the crawl space. And we thought, well, there's no way we can rent this house with these levels of radon in it. So we're going to have to do some radon mitigation. And uh, <clears throat> so we had a, a, a whole sump system put in down in the crawl space and sealed it with some really thick, uh, it was like a three layer plastic, white plastic down there. It's, it's very nice now, but it was very expensive to do all this stuff. But when we retested the house, it was at zero. So these systems do work. Um, it went from a high radon environment to uh, absolutely no radon. It's all being vented out the top of the house. So these systems work, and I, I would predict that uh, we're going to see some of this stuff ending up in the codes eventually, too. Um, I, we're getting ready to sell a house in Colorado, and it's required out there that we have to run a test. It doesn't have to be by a certified uh, install, uh, tester, but it can be. I, I can go to Home Depot and buy that puck and put it in the house. So in Colorado, it's already been required to sell a house. But not necessarily in the code yet. So moving on, uh, you can see here wood frame walls, our values. Um, that has uh, changed from the 2012 to the 2015-18. Um, so that second number is the uh, our value of the uh, 
that's a continuous insulation on the outside. So you can either have an R20 wall or R13 plus 5. Um, so just uh, be aware that that's changed a little bit. Um, this, once again, is just a really good, uh, it's a publication that uh, Ryan and I ran across that addresses uh, envelope performance a lot. It has to do with um, <clears throat> thermal bridging. And thermal bridging, it's a very good, well-done publication. So for those of you that are interested in high-performance buildings, uh, I would recommend you take a look at that. Uh, that link will take you right to that publication. Um, so thermal bridging, it really is a, it's a big deal. It's uh, a lot of our consulting work with HUD had to do with mold and moisture problems, and a lot of those had to do with thermal bridging. I have pictures of mold 16 inches on center on where the walls and the, and the ceilings met, and um, they were low heel trusses, so there wasn't a lot of insulation up in those areas. The houses had a lot of people in them, so a lot of moisture being generated. Well, that moisture saw those cold spots, and that's a first place mold uh, uh, was, was evident in the construction, 16 inches on center. <clears throat> So here you can see, we have a wall that's got a cavity insulation of R20, and then we've got some sheathing and then uh, continuous insulation on the outside. So you look at that, that's 32.6, you think, well, that's a pretty darn good wall. But once you take into account the highly conductive metal stud that's either 16 or 24 inches in center, that drops down to 14.3 once we take into account the conductivity of that, that, that stud. So that's not, that's not really a great wall, you know, by today's standards. You know, you look at that, it's like, wow, that's pretty good. You look at that, you go, well, that's kind of crummy, you know. So that all has to do with thermal bridging. So thermal bridging really is a big deal. Um, we have some thermal cameras. Um, at, at CDAC, and occasionally we take these on our assessments. This was a, uh, a rural health clinic that was built. Uh, well, we were there in 2011. It was a fairly new building, and it was kind of shocking that we're going into new buildings to do energy assessments when you think, well, this is a new building. Why are we here? Well, they actually had instances of frost on the window sills on the inside, and this is a brand new hospital uh, or clinic. <clears throat> And they're like, well, what, what's the problem here? Well, with the thermal images you can see right here, so we're looking at the infrared spectrum right here. So the temperatures in this photograph, this photograph is this in real life, or well, in, 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 in what we see, the spectrum that we see, and this is the thermal uh, infrared spectrum. So we're going, we've got a 28 temper degree temperature difference in this picture right here. So that's probably the 41 degrees down here at the bottom of the window. So that's pretty darn cold. And it really wasn't that cold of a day outside. I think it was in the 30s, if I'm not mistaken. You can see the window is pretty warm. That's, the insulated glass is doing a pretty good job. The frame is not doing a very good job. I don't know if this had any thermal breaks in that aluminum frame or not. Uh, we did not see the construction drawings. And then this, this is a picture of the wall. Um, so you can see every stud, you can see, you can actually see the fasteners here. And here there is a 11 degree delta T between the field where there's insulation and the stud. So a huge temperature difference. So these portions of the wall where the studs are, are much colder. If we're going to have mold forming, that's where it's going to form, on these studs. That's the first place because these are going to be the wetter portion of the wall than the warmer, drier portion of the wall. So I could almost guarantee you that there is no continuous insulation on the outside of this building isolating those, those metal studs. So this is a problem. And you, you know, they ask you, what are we going to do about this? Well, there's not much you can do about this. Yeah, I mean, you can fix this problem, but it's going to cost a lot of money. And the best solution would be to cover this nice brick wall with EIFS on the outside. That would be the easiest solution to fixing this problem. Um, doing it from the inside is, you know, that's not a very good solution because you've got intersecting walls. 
You're, you've got the, you know, what are you going to do with the floor system? So all kinds of problems on, and all the stuff that's on hospital walls. You know, so fixing this from the inside is, you know, that's not a good solution. Fixing it from the outside is possible, but you're getting rid of that nice brick exterior. And, uh, and there's still detailing problems, but at least not as much stuff that you have to work around on the outside. So a uh, big problem. So thermal bridging is a, is a big deal. Uh, what do we have here? Building, uh, mass walls. Um, that's changed a little bit too. Um, from the 2015, uh, 2012, 2015, the 2018. Uh, those numbers, uh, I don't know what the old numbers were, but those numbers, I'm just bringing those to your attention because some of that has changed. I'd have to pick up the old code book see what those have changed but just to be aware if you're doing a mass wall which would be a school or a community building possibly this is another example of uh, just text changes where this basically says the 2018 ICC says basically the same thing that it said in the 2015 it's just clarified it a little better broken it apart so easier to read so it's, it's nothing, nothing information-wise really hasn't changed there. Uh, the building thermal envelope, the new, in, it, it was new in 2015, the ICC, the vapor retarder. Vapor retarders have been in the codes for a long time, but uh, as a matter of fact, they used to be vapor barriers, but have been changed to vapor retarders. Um, I still sometimes call it vapor barriers, which sort of dates me. Um, um, but uh, so this is new in the 2015 ICC. It was brought from the. Uh, it's both now in the IECC and the IRC, International Red um, uh, Residential Code. You can see here it is in section R702.7 and. We have, so in the IRC, changing to the IRC from the IECC, 2.7 vapor retarders. So you can see there's, there's um, <clears throat> different classes of vapor retarder. Class one and two vapor retarders are required on the interior side. In climate zone five, you don't see, you see marine, marine four, but we don't have any of that here. So this applies to only zone five Climate zone five. Um, exceptions are basement walls, below grade portions of the walls, or uh, so that's out of the IRC. And staying in the IRC, you can see that uh, the different classes, class one is basically sheet polyurethane, or uh, polyethylene, I'm sorry. Uh, class two, craft based fiberglass bats, and class three, latex or enamel paint. Um, and just uh, from the DOE, some other examples of vapor retarders. You know, this is the one where most all of us are familiar with polyethylene sheet goods for class one. It allows very little moisture transfer. Class two allows a little more uh, moisture transfer, 30 pound felt, stuff like that that we're all familiar with. And then class three uh, allows much more transfer of moisture. Um, so class three vapor retards, they are permitted um, uh, in one of these uh, situations where we're using vented cladding or certain levels of continuous insulation. Um, how many of you builders uh, do vented cladding? Well, we've got an airspace behind the, uh, the cladding. So not too many. There's a couple. There's a couple. Yeah, and you're going to see more of this. I mean, it's a great way to build. Uh, it helps keep that, that uh, it's more expensive, but it uh, helps keep that cladding dry, and it really reduces the amount of moisture that can transfer uh, back into the wall system. It sort of isolates that uh, exterior material from the rest of the, the construction. 
So the minimum air, clear air spaces in the IRC, those are basically one inch, uh, a one inch furring strip or some way to keep that siding away from the uh, rest of the wall assembly. So uh, back to the IRC and our R value computation, there's some additional text that was added in uh, 2015 and it's still in the 2018. Uh, we, and that's the blue text of the, at the bottom where insulated siding is used for the purpose of complying. Uh, your uh, labeled R value for the insulated siding shall be reduced by 0.06. And I would imagine that's because when the siding is probably tested, they included the air films on the inside and outside and they're getting rid of that. Uh, so you're just getting the R value of the uh, assembly or the component itself. Uh, Illinois has some specific amendments to the uh, basement walls, um, and that's that exception. The walls uh, associated with conditioned basements uh, may be insulated from the top of the basement wall down four feet, and I think the code reads 10 feet, isn't that? Yeah, and that was changed by the Illinois amendments, so you don't have to go down as far. Uh, air leakage mandatory. Um, Ryan covered some of this. Um, so this was uh, basically introduced in 2012 is when uh, 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 air leakage testing was made mandatory. Um, and we're going down to three air changes per hour, as Ryan mentioned. Um, which uh, we used to do a lot of testing uh, on these HUD trips to uh, Indian Reservation. It first started out just mold and moisture uh, uh, forensics, and then it turned into uh, uh, including blower door testing and, and looking at the energy consumption in these buildings. And so we ran literally hundreds of these blower door tests, and they're fascinating tests to, 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 to uh, observe and be a part of uh, because sometimes you will find leaks in places you had never guessed would leak. I remember walking through the pathway uh, from the hallway into a bedroom and I could feel a breeze somewhere. It's just like where is that air movement coming from? And it was through the hole in the strike plate. Somebody drilled through the uh, door frame and so you could look into the cavity back behind the, uh, the uh, framing of the door, and it was just like, where is all that air coming from? And it was either, and we never really did figure it out. We didn't know if it was coming from the attic or the crawl space, and, but our solution, our recommendation was spray foam that hole so that air may be able to get in a cavity, but it can't continue on into the, uh, into the uh, occupied space. So you can find some leaks with these blower door tests that you would never have guessed there was a leak there. And uh, can lights are notorious for leaking. Um, you can feel like outlets sometimes are, are on exterior walls, even interior walls. When the wire goes down into the crawl space, you're sometimes drawing air up from the crawl space into that wall cavity and it's leaking around the outlets or switches. Some, some odd things sometimes. So um, the blower toast tests, and they can be, you know, we could be in and out of the house in a half hour uh, setting up the blower door tests and doing the tests. So it doesn't take that long, and it really is informative. So it's a, they're great tests. Um, so uh, R42.4.1.2 testing. This once again gets back to what Ryan was talking about. It was a five air changes per hour. We're going down. Um, so you can see here in 2018, uh, they made, they're made they making even more changes to uh, that, that, that portion of the code. Um, and the testing must be, uh, you can see they crossed all that out. And I don't know, uh, do you care to mention something about that? Sure. Yeah, this was, uh, they had originally left uh, a bunch of the text in and said, wherever your, your home is under five air changes per hour, you have to do mechanical ventilation. Uh, 
so this they just simplified it and said well, because we're in the state of Illinois and we require it to be under five air changes per hour, I don't need to say if it's under five air changes per hour, just do mechanical ventilation. And so I, I don't have to start with the preface that I know is already taken care of. Thank you. So uh, uh, it amended by the state of Illinois, that section you can see at the bottom, um, that te uh, the testing, uh, heated attached private garage spaces and heated detached private garage spaces shall be thermally isolated from all other, all other uh, habitable confined spaces, or conditioned spaces. Um, that's a good idea, uh, isolating your garage. And this is sort of on a, on a tangent, uh, once again. Uh, I had some friends that were doing some research here at the U of I where they put up some very sophisticated uh, uh, air analysis equipment in homes that had fireplaces. They were, they were the type of fire, gas fireplaces that vented to the inside. They wanted to see what the impact, I think it was an ASHRAE project, they wanted to see what the impact was on the air quality on the inside spaces of these vented, uh, unvented uh, fireplaces. And it turned out that, that the graphs they produced were very interesting because you can see the oxygen levels drop, but these things didn't stay on long enough that it really impacted, and there were all kinds of other pollutants on the inside of the spaces too that it was picking up. But none of that really was, would impact health that much. Uh, it was amazing that uh, the, the, the results that they found, they were kind of surprised themselves, but what they did find, which surprised everybody, was they could pick up when people would start their cars in the garage, and they would pick up those pollutants on the inside of the residence. That those, it took very short time for those pollutants from the garage to migrate into the interior. And that was probably the most interesting finding of that whole study was, gosh, you know, you probably shouldn't run your car in the garage very long because those pollutants find their ways to the insides, all those combustion byproducts to the uh, inside of your structure. Uh, building thermal envelope. Uh, like I said, most of these changes are in this, this portion of the code. Um, a, a dressing room con, uh, containing fuel burning appliances. This was added to the IECC in 2015. Illinois amended it out. And uh, it had to do with um, uh, the section, as it says there, required rooms or open air combustion, uh, ducts provided combustion air, fuel burning appliances, furnaces, and water heaters. They should be isolated from the condition space, which is a good idea, especially now um, that we're building such tight houses if you turn on your clothes dryer, your uh, rain hood, and your bath fan at the same time, you have the potential to negatively depressurize your, stealth, uh, your spaces to a quite pretty big degree. And the potential there, if you ha don't have sealed combustion appliances, is backdrafting. Backdrafting uh, the water heater or the furnace and, and sucking those uh, combustion gases to the inside of the structure. So. Um, as we tighten our houses, uh, there are certain things can, that can uh, uh, become a problem if we don't address that. Ah, and now, finally, uh, my colleague, Ryan, can take back over. Ryan's much better at this than I am. <laughs> Thank you. Before we get away from the building envelope too far, uh, I did want to call attention to something uh, that I failed to put in the presentation, and that is there's a, a table, R402.4.1.1, so that's R402.411, um, that talks about air barriers and insulation for the building envelope. Nearly every problem that, that we have encountered with building envelopes is covered in that table. So that, that's one that if you're going to have an issue, that table is probably where, where it's covered, where something was missed. Uh, so uh, that is something that I definitely want to make sure that I'm, 
I will mention that. Uh, as far as now, now we're getting into systems, so this is uh, HVAC and hot water uh, heating system. Uh, so as far as hot water heating system uh, for temperature maintenance, uh, so either recirculation systems, uh, heat trace systems, uh, or the like. We don't see heat trace used too frequently, but uh, this is a, a new set section that is mandatory. So if you install one of these, then they have to comply with the uh, requirements therein. Uh, as far as 2018, uh, again, I'm trying to figure out how uh, construction and, and code kind of meets together. Uh, this is looking at ducts buried in the ceiling insulation, and how do we treat this? There are some additional provisions where uh, when you're burying your ducts, uh, you can have some additional, uh, you can take some benefits from that ceiling insulation. Uh, so they may be able to relax some of the ductwork insulation requirements if you've already buried them in the ceiling insulation. So it's, you're taking advantage of some of that benefit and uh, some of the criteria here. So. Something else the, the code talks about is uh, duct testing, uh, where duct testing is required if your ducts are not fully in the conditioned space. And part of that is, well, how do I determine if they're fully in the conditioned space or not? Uh, obviously, if they're totally inside your air barrier, uh, then they're in the conditioned space. Uh, or uh, you have another path. Now, it's a little strange because you want to know if they're in the conditioned space so you don't have to test them. But if they're not in the inside of the air barrier, then you have to test it to meet this exception, to not have to test it. Uh, but noting that uh, yeah, there, is, uh, there is some alternatives here. Uh, so obviously if they're fully buried in the ducts, they're fully buried in the insulation. You don't really see them too much in the insulation. Uh, <clears throat> but the code now has added a provision for if you're going through simulated building energy performance, that <clears throat> how to treat this. Uh, so the code is, has added another provision. Uh, prior to this, if you did a building uh, simulation and they were not fully buried in the insulation, then you had to treat them as though they were exposed. Uh, the codes added some additional efficiency requirements. Uh, one of these is for HRV and ERV fans. Now these fans are going to run continuous or nearly continuous, so energy efficiency on continuous operating equipment is fairly important. Uh, and so I don't see too frequently that this is likely to be a problem because ERVs and HRVs tend to be, you know, a little bit more of a premium product uh, for most places, so they'll generally have efficient fans built in. Uh, but I call it out just in case. <clears throat> uh, Illinois amendments, uh, this is something where uh, Illinois made several amendments to their energy code, and, and that's actually a lot of what that packet I showed you was is all this is, is they are dragging pieces of the uh, other codes, the mechanical code in particular, and, and the residential code, and bringing it into the Illinois Energy Code. So this is just a bunch of tables that they've pulled forward uh, to the Illinois Energy Code. Uh, so it even has uh, some things like whole house mechanical ventilation, where you can actually cycle them, uh, so you can uh, perhaps install one uh, if you determine you need uh, 70 CFM of continuous ventilation, you can size it, uh, you know, 140 CFM and operate it 30 minutes every hour. So you can, you can cycle them. Uh, and that's in some of these tables. Uh, so this does touch on one point. For those jurisdictions that are on a code older than 2009, 
there is a potential issue of a vapor barrier being missed. Uh, because prior to 2009, the vapor barrier requirements were in the energy code, and in 2009, they moved them from the energy code into the residential and mechanical codes. So if you have a jurisdiction that's on a, on a building code that's pre-2009, the energy code is 2018, neither code addresses it. So that is a, a potential issue that you do run into. Now, if you don't put it in, technically you didn't end up violating a code. However, you're going to end up with problems uh, and potential liability. So, code is obviously a, a minimum standard that we need to we need to meet. Uh, closed dryer exhaust. Uh, this was something that they had picked up uh, in 2018, uh, noting that we really don't want to restrict dryer exhaust. Uh, vents. So uh, sometimes where if you have uh, a home uh, or a set of apartments that all duct their dryers and then at the end they want to pinch them down so they don't have to drill as big of a hole, uh, the mechanical code came back and said you need to make sure that you're providing that full four inch round duct or equivalent space at the outlet. Uh, water pipe insulation, uh, the requirements were decreased from 2012 to 2015. Uh, 2018, they've uh, remained basically the same for the residential side. For pools, uh, they have increased how much site recovered energy uh, has, to be, uh, has to be used in order to not require a pool cover. Uh, pool covers are required uh, for most heated pools. Obviously, if it's not heated, then there's no energy that I'm losing. Uh, lighting equipment uh, increasing from 75% up to 90% of all permanently installed fixtures must have high efficacy lamps. This is the big one. They removed the low voltage lighting exception in 2018. So beforehand, a lot of times people would get away from this and just say, well, okay, I'll just put in some low voltage track lighting. I could put in all the MR16s I want because they don't count. 2018 fixed, uh, changed that, so now everything counts. Now with this 90%, that still gives you 10% for, uh, you know, some, uh, specialty lighting and other uh, high lighting features that you may want. Uh, high efficacy lamps, uh, this is where there is an Illinois amendment uh, pending. Uh, the code calls out, depending on the wattage, what it is. Uh, Illinois has gotten away from that and just said, here, 65 lumens per watt for lamps, 55 lumens per watt for fixtures, and we're done. It doesn't matter how many watts it is. Uh, now we did, a, uh, did do a, a study and because uh, there was some questions about, well, how big of an issue is this new requirement as far as high efficacy lamps? Uh, went out and did a market study uh, in, of, I think, what is it, 400 and some odd fixtures we checked uh, and, and lamps we checked. It was 85% met this threshold. So most of the, the equipment that's out there no problems with this. And even some of the cheap stuff met the requirement, no problem. It was actually more of the higher end stuff that ended up uh, not meeting the requirement, which is a little backwards from what you'd think. Uh, simulated uh, performance, they've added mechanical ventilation uh, to the simulation, and they did it for both your proposed model and the baseline. Uh, noting that mechanical ventilation, this is energy uh, that your home is using. However, it does exclude vehicle car charging from the model, both, both sides. Because understanding that charging an electric vehicle is not 
part of your building's energy uh, performance. Multifamily units for modeling. Uh, this allows for batch sampling. Uh, what this is is if I have two identical units, same exposure, same size, you know, basically identical uh, models. They may be mirror images of each other, uh, but for that, I only have to run the model once. I don't have to keep rerunning the same model over and over again to get the same result. Definition of insanity. Uh, so with this, if you have a group of buildings uh, that are all the same, uh, you may have, uh, you, you may end up with, uh, I want to say, 12, uh, 12 building models, one for each unit that's on each side. Uh, ERI, uh, this is something where uh, Illinois has made this allowable by default. Prior to, uh, with the 2015 uh, version, it required uh, your code official's approval to use the ERI method. For the 2018 model uh, year, you're able to use it uh, without requiring uh, approval of the code official. So, uh, this they've made a little change because uh, ResNet is now also an ICC standard. Funny how that works. Uh, they have raised the allowable score from 2015 to 2018. Uh, it's gone up, uh, you can see, by uh, seven or eight points that you're allowed to have as far as the HERS score uh, or ERI score and meet your code compliance. Uh, how many, uh, I think we had touched on this, have any of you gone through and done a HERS rating? Any of your projects? One. Okay. Yeah. This is this is no, oh, that's fine. That's um, <clears throat> this is actually they were they made this change uh, because that's kind of what they've been seeing is people haven't been using it, and so they've raised this score trying to encourage people to do this uh, to use this app uh, versus the prescriptive or building energy model. Oh. Existing buildings, uh, this they've got uh, five different sections. This, is, uh, this was new in 2015. Uh, prior to 2015 they just ignored existing buildings, which seemed a little silly because then you ended up with People trying to figure out, well, okay, now if I have an existing building and I touch it, now do I have to bring the whole thing? And it got kind of messy. Uh, so there's five sections. The biggest ones are additions and alterations. The gist of this is whatever you're working on, that scope of work must comply with the new code. You don't have to touch something else. Uh, so uh, one example of this is it states if you open a wall, if you open a wall and expose the wall cavity, you must insulate the wall cavity. Now, they do provide you a provision that you don't have to provide the full R20 or 13 plus 5. It says that wall is considered insulated if you fill the cavity with insulation. If it's filled, you did the best you could with what you have. You know, I'm not going to make you build the wall out because that's kind of funny. Uh, now, uh, what we have come across is, particularly with the, the city of Chicago, and we kind of agree uh, with, with this from a building science perspective, uh, if you have a uh, masonry wall, you know, a structural masonry wall, you know, a masonry wall that you open up and expose the cavity, you have to fill the cavity but you, are, uh, you need to leave that one inch air gap between the masonry and your insulation. Because if you don't, you are likely to, you, you're, you're going to hold moisture in that brick wall and you're going to destroy the masonry. So from a building science perspective, you don't want that insulation to contact that masonry uh, wall. So 
That is something that the city of Chicago said, if you leave that one inch air gap and you fill the rest of it, we'll call that fill. So. Now here's the unaltered portions shall not be required to comply with the codes. So it's whatever you're touching, that's what you have to make comply. So this really gets into things such as when you start getting into roofs, particularly flat roofs, and you try to meet, uh, try to meet the insulation requirements, you're adding insulation, and you're likely to run into things such as mechanical curbs, fenestration, you know, things like that where you can't meet the requirement. There's, you know, and so what the code comes back and says, do the best you can within the existing constraints. So if you've got a, a roof and you can add one more inch, and in order to be code compliant, you'd need to add three, give me the one. I'll take the one I can get. You don't have to pick up all the HVAC equipment and rebuild all the curbs to comply because the HVAC equipment is not part of your roof. Uh, this was an uh, Illinois amendment, noting new ducts, you don't have to necessarily test new ducts, but you must seal them. Um, obviously, you, you know, if you're adding, you know, you're, you're adding a room and you're adding one run of ducts, trying to bring all the existing duct work up to code compliance, you know, again, what are you touching, what are you not touching? Um, so they just call back and say, you're not necessarily testing it, but make sure that you seal it. Uh, building envelope, this is kind of what I talked about uh, just a moment ago, where if you can't provide it due to existing limitations, do the best you can with what you have within the confines. Uh, they call out that it must be a minimum of R3.5 per inch. They do have uh, tapered insulation uh, in the IECC, uh, which residential, we probably don't get into too much, uh, but it is out there. Uh, again, here it is. If you do new ducts, make sure you seal them. And here it is, more, more tapered insulation. So, uh, with that, uh, if you guys do have any questions, we'll be happy to take them today. If you do think of anything later or uh, if you need help on a project, uh, feel free to reach out to us, uh, energycode at cdac.org. Uh, one thing I, I would ask is if you email us a question, please try to provide, <clears throat> uh, you know, give, give some uh, enough information particularly to know, am I in a residential building or am I in a commercial building? Because uh, I will say it has definitely happened on more than one occasion where I'm going through and I'm looking at something and I'm like, this just doesn't make sense. And I look back and I look and I look and I look and I realize I'm in the wrong section of the book. So because the commercial and residential are fairly different, uh, so that is one, one ask I would have uh, of that. Um, but yeah, we're here to, to serve anyone across the state of Illinois, uh, including anything related to a project in the state of Illinois. So, like we've even had uh, Nebraska and Iowa and Michigan contact us. When is the 18 going to be adopted? Ah, that slide was missing. Uh, at the present time, at the present time, uh, it is anticipated that the 18 will become effective June 1st. So just one month from tomorrow uh, is the anticipated date as of today. Uh, our website uh, will continue to be uh, updated with the most recent information, uh, and we will we'll also keep it in our, our newsletter as far as what the official date is. Uh, so yes, it's moved from March to April to May, now June. So in June, they have a copy of the Correct. Correct. Yes, the eighteen, the eighteen IECC with the Illinois amendments will all all become effective. 
Uh, and that's where our resources page will also have links back to not only the code book, but also those amendment documents as well. Uh, fortunately, the, the Illinois amendments are, are, there's not a whole lot of them. And then Chicago has a few separate ones. So that's mostly heat island effect and, uh, and things like that. Um, All right. I want to thank everyone for coming today. I got one more. I'll see you guys. Yeah. Those are yet to be scheduled. We're we're not sure. We're still coordinating with CDB and the Attorney General's office. So. <coughs>